It sounded great. I love that song, and it's going to be a theme of our sermon today. But you uh, know we're in Acts, so find it. Acts chapter 1. We are in the second week of, I think it's going to be 40 weeks or so, something like that, of uh, our study in the book of Acts. Um, I'll do this on occasion. I'll make a confession before I preach. So here's my confession. I am not a patient man. Anybody relate to that? Anybody at all? And it's not like, like, it's not like I'm going to lose my temper, although that's potential. It's, it's like I'm in a hurry, that, that kind of impatient. I, I, don't, like, I don't like to wait. Um, several years ago, my family, my kids and my wife said, hey, it would be good for you to have some kind of project to do with your hands, and we really think you should do that. So I bought an old truck, started working on it. But this thing that was supposed to be casual for my good and leisure turned into a mission from God, Okay. And I, if I wasn't here, I was there working, and I worked my tail off. It was not at all what I would call a casual experience. Um, and he, here's, here's why it turns out that way, because I stink at waiting. I absolutely stink at it. I don't like to wait for anything. And uh, so we're, we're dealing with a passage today. I would call it this obscure little island section of verses 12 through 26 that is the waiting passage. We have seen... Jesus ascend into heaven, giving these instructions to his people about his return. And he promises them as he leaves, there's going to be a, the Holy Spirit will arrive. Wait for the promise. Now we got this waiting passage, right? I'm certain I would have struggled with that command. Wait for the Spirit. I would have asked a thousand questions. I'd have been in a hurry. I probably couldn't have slept at night. But here we have this wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm sorry to do this to you, but we're going to wait too. Most people, if I pick up a commentary, will jump from verse 11 to beginning of chapter 2 in a big hurry. A couple of observations about the last section of chapter 1, but into the Spirit's work. And I get it. I get it. I'm excited about it too. But the reason why I want us to wait beyond the fact that I think there's a little parallel between Jesus' instruction to his church and us is that there is something seriously powerful already going on here in this section before the Spirit comes, which is really important to notice here. Like I said before, most of the commentators I read are in a hurry to go from the promise given to the promise delivered, but we have kind of given a title to this this passage of a description of the exceptional church, and so we have some obligations every time we come to it. Some questions we need to ask and deal with, all right? What's going on with this church? Why is it happening and what should it look like in our experience? Because we, we don't want to be uh, just the people who hear about somebody else. We've said that before. Now, I was uh, mentioning this title to Tyler last week, and he goes, ah, he acted a little itchy about the exceptional church. And I can totally understand his perspective. So let me clarify what I mean and don't mean by the title, the exceptional church. Th- this particular sub um, line for this sermon series um, isn't a description of a special people. It has nothing to do with us being better than others or perfect. It has nothing to do with a church that can, we're the only church that does it right, so we're the exceptional church. It's not a position of arrogance or a position of pride. Here's what I mean by that title, the exceptional church. It's a church made up of a whole bunch of ragtag people broken over their sin humbled by what Jesus has done. It is a description of a people from every walk of life, every color and creed, everybody, every group of people who, who are changed by the power and the grace of God. That's what I mean by the exceptional church. It, it's a people who keep short accounts with their sin as they seek to obey Jesus and all that he commands. It's the description of the new community people who understand what it is to belong to each other, who live so differently, we are a shining light on a hill to a world in darkness. The exceptional church, not a special people, a saved people, right? Sinners transformed, right? Everybody's welcome. You got sin, come on in. That's what we're gonna say because Jesus doesn't leave us like he found us. Make sense? That's what I mean by the exceptional church. And that's why we made a promise last week to each other that we were going to push into our lives with really serious questions. Because if this is a description of what it is to do it right, then we better ask with the reflection, are we? And if not, why? And what do we need to do about it? That's why I said some, some of these things are going to get really, really uncomfortable. 
not intentionally, but I think the Holy Spirit does that because I have no interest in just learning. I want to become what Jesus and the power of the Spirit provide for us. So that's where we're going. The text we're in is verses 12 through 26 of chapter 1 this morning. Let me, before we get into it, give you a couple observations and, and one little comment, all right? These, first, these 15 verses are the first recorded acts of the church. So if you want to know where all this starts and how it's expressing itself, this is what we've got. Right out, of the, right out of the gate, we have this behavior showing itself in the bride of Christ. The other thing, and I've already just kind of touched on it, but really important to understand and keep in the back of your mind as we go through this, everything we see in this passage today is before Pentecost. The coming and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, this whole description is before that happens, really important. And the other thing is just a comment. I would say this as a pastor of this church. If this could be the description of our church, I'd die and go to heaven. This is awesome. This is a wonderful description. In fact, I told the guys in the preaching collective on Wednesday, who, who, wouldn't, who wouldn't want this for your congregation? And, and that's why this is so powerful to us. We're going to see why here in just a second. So, Let's answer a couple of questions. What's happening and why? Let me deal with the why first before we read the text. Um, there is a huge thing that these disciples have just experienced. Their hope, their savior has risen from the dead. He had spent 40 days with them, instructing them from the Old Testament scriptures about himself. And there they are standing on the hill and he ascends into heaven with a promise, I'm coming back just like you see me leaving right now, all right? So there is something powerful here that the resurrection and the promised return of Jesus empowers a faith that is amazing in this particular text. Just remember, the disciples walked with Jesus for three years and they witnessed all the miracles, all the magic, walking on water, healing of limbs and changing of skin and raising of the dead. They saw it all. They heard every sermon and every word out of his mouth. They, they had it all. But when he died, they scattered. As soon as this miracle worker suffered, they ran for the hills. They were terrified. They thought it was over. Something happened through the power of the resurrection that transformed their faith that we are going to see today, okay? We, I don't know if I mentioned it here last week, but that, that longing look that the disciples were giving to the ascending Jesus, that word looking is the idea, implies a long gaze as if you're losing someone. So even in their mind, the last minute before they receive the promise of his return, they're kind of going, well, maybe this is over. It's like a longing, sad departure kind of look. And then from heaven rings, hey, 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 don't sweat it, he's coming back. So if you take in total his resurrection and you take his promise to come back as he left, something transformed what the disciples did with their life at that moment, at least we have in these 15 verses, all right? And I would suggest to you that this faith in the risen and returning Lord sinks so deep in them that it transforms them into the early stages of this exceptional church, okay? So let's look at what's happening now. Verses 12 through 15, let me suggest to you this, that this faith in the risen Lord unites them like never before. 12 through 15, when they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away, and when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. All of these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 people, Okay. Listen, let me give you some background, um, set the scene a little bit. Sabbath day's journey is important because I think Luke refers to it because it is the Sabbath day. And according to the Mishnah, the extra law, a good, rightful Jew would not travel beyond what the law allowed and the law allowed about two-thirds of a mile. So just imagine the Mount of Olivet where Jesus rose and this upper room, not very far, just a short little distance away. The upper room, the word the in front of upper room refers to a definitive article, meaning it's the room. So somewhere in Luke's mind, he's referring to something that they would know that's the place. Possibly, probably, the place where Jesus broke bread with his disciples before he went to the cross. That upper room. 
probably, more than likely, the place where when he returned um, from the dead, that he would meet and teach the disciples. This was the common upper room. It was kind of a big space if 120 people could gather in it. So just picture a very familiar uh, place where Jesus meets them. And here they are all together. I want you to notice, and probably just kind of skip by it too fast, I want you to notice how unique the gathering is. According to Luke, he mentions the 11 who follow Jesus. He mentions the women who follow Jesus, probably the women that represented those who showed up at the tomb the morning of the resurrection, probably. Um, he mentions Jesus' mother and brothers, and then he says about a hundred and something more people were there um, at that time before Peter began to talk. Now, you hear a list like that and you go, Wh whatever, let's move on. Give me to the punchline. But l let me make a punchline out of this. Um, I want you to think about the relationships in that hodgepodge of people. Or, or maybe better said, the lack of relationship that were represented in that room, potentially. Maybe the tension. L let me just describe to you the types of people and their issues in that room. You have Peter, who likes to talk a good game, but doesn't deliver. He wants to be leader, but he runs when leadership is needed. That's, that guy's there. Thomas, who has to touch the wounds, has to feel the size. This guy doesn't believe anything that was said. He's got to put his eyes on it. He was there. James and John. All they're known for is wrestling for power, like who's going to be on the right and left? Who's going to be in charge? Can we be in charge? Now, I would imagine the rest of the disciples are kind of going, get a little of these guys. I mean, we're all here. We did the three years together. Who are you to think you should take leadership? They're there. At one point, we know this from the Gospels, that Jesus' family came to where Jesus was ministering and tried to retrieve him and take him home because they thought he was losing his mind. They're there. So I don't know if the disciples are looking at mom and the brothers and going, we don't even trust him. They were trying to stop the mission of Jesus, so here they are now in the upper room, of course, according to the text. I know this. Untold numbers of people were there who had been forgiven from scandalous sin. Sin that no self-respecting Jew would have anything to do with, and they were there. You know, the reputation stuff and the legacy things and the wounds and the scars, and they're there. There's the people who have horrible reputations, and they're there. Mary Magdalene is described as someone who was possessed with demons. She's there. How about the sinful woman of Luke 7? Prostitute? She's there, possibly. W what about the Pharisee Nicodemus, the Sadducee? He's res these guys are responsible for our Savior's death. Is Nicodemus there? Is he in the upper room? Well, what about the rich? Joseph of Arathia, he provided the tomb for Jesus. Was he there? And after all that Jesus said about rich guys getting into heaven, I got a problem with him. You get my point here, right? You understand this mess of humanity from every perspective is in this room of 120, according to Luke, united as one. Something happened. Something big happened. Every one of them had their reason for being there. And yet Luke says they were in one accord. Why? Not to make it light, because we say it all the time. The answer to almost every question we ask you is Jesus. Jesus. Why is this ragtag group of people, why is this messy form of humanity all gathered, united as one? Jesus is the reason. The resurrected Lord is the reason. Faith in that reality. I can only imagine here they were sitting, waiting, sharing their loneliness, their grief, maybe their um, concern over the absence of Jesus, talking and wondering about the future. He made a promise. What do you think that's going to look like? And when is that going to happen? Maybe they were beginning to open their hearts to each other, probably were. More than likely in that contained environment. Now remember, Jesus spent 40 days with them. Now we've got 10 days before the coming of the Holy Spirit. 10 days together waiting. My guess is they're chatting. Hey, man, when you said that thing about taking leadership, I was offended. When you said that thing, when, when you actually joined our team and I knew where you came from, I was concerned. My guess is that they were confessing to each other and sharing their hurts with each other. They were reconciling with each other. 
I believe it to be the expression of the promise of the prayer that Jesus made in John 17. Everyone knows John 17 is a high priestly prayer. This is Jesus praying for his bride. And just to give you a couple of verses to describe Jesus' heart for this situation, he says, the glory that you, were, you have given me, Jesus speaking to the Father, I have given to them, the church, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as I have loved you. Th- th- this is an amazing truth. Jesus has prayed for this one, this is unity, and here it is. Here it is, the beginning of the church. Now, you remember we said that we wanna be like this, right? We wanna be the exceptional church. So let's make some practical applications. I don't know how comfortably you'll be doing this, but look around. Just do it. Look around at each other. Messy, isn't it? Every age, every stage, every opinion, every color, no matter what, we got it represented here. A thousand people. All these different upbringings, everything is represented in this room every type of person, may I suggest every hurt and every pain is in this room. What unites us? Is it that we all share the same experience? We walk on the same side of the street? We've all had the same kind of life? Have the same perspective? You know the answer, right? What's the answer? No, that's not why we're united. Here's why we're united. Simple badge covers us. We are all sinners saved by grace, right? People, the world wants to divide us based on color, based on creed, based on experience, based on age. They want to divide us. Jesus says, listen, you're all sinners in need of my grace, my transforming grace. We all share that. Every one of us share that. I need him. You need him. What unites us is faith in that reality. Now, I've got to ask this question because we're the church. Is there a relationship with a brother and sister in your life that's broken? Mother, father, child, friend, is there one? What's the problem? You want me to just jump to the conclusion what I think the problem is? Pride. Somewhere, pride says, no, the offense is too great. Too great. Even though the scriptures make it clear that I I am to forgive out of the resource of forgiveness I've received, an overwhelming amount of forgiveness I've received, and I have enough resource to do that, no, my offense are greater than the offense I've created between God and me. And you have a issue of arrogance. And let me just suggest to you, maybe there's some stubbornness in you, maybe there's some bitterness in you, let me give you the key to dealing with these things in such a way that you look like the exceptional church. Love is the goal. Here's how you get there. You confess and you reconcile. It's going to involve some repentance. Like I, I, I'm not trying to undermine the quantity of hurt that we've experienced from each other. I'm just suggesting to you that the gospel is bigger than that and it's going to require a sit down. And a, a conversation. If we're going to go through this passage together, we're going to hear about a church that u- unifies over the resurrection. And we're going to go, isn't that cute for them? And we don't leave here going, we better ask some questions. This is a pointless endeavor. Let's go home and watch football, okay? So just, just sort that out. When you're making your little notes, say, he got me on that. And you can put your name. I sat in a service like 40 years ago, and I heard a sermon, and I was convicted to the core about a name. And before I had lunch, I called that person. I was convicted. So if you're convicted, deal with it, yeah? Let me just show you something else. Our faith in the resurrected Lord, the promise of the return of the Lord unifies us. It also does this. It empowers a prayerfulness. A prayerfulness. Verse 14, you almost skipped over it when we read it, but it says here that they were in one accord devoting themselves to prayer. The word devote is a particular word that Luke uses here. It's a, it, in Greek, it signifies invincible constancy and steadfastness. Ooh, that's some big prayer. Like committed prayer. Uh, I, I know this because it's true of my own heart. One quick way to make the church feel bad about itself is to talk, start talking about prayer. Specifically devoted prayer. 
never given up prayer. And we would all go, man, I probably could do better. I've always failed in my own life at doing what I knew I should do and following through on commitments I have made. I, I'm a weak prayer. Maybe it's because I'm an impatient man. I, I don't know what it is, but let me just throw down some ideas that you might struggle with. Why is it hard? Well, I would suggest to you being American makes it hard. <laughs> and I mean it by this, because we're used to fixing stuff. Nothing that energy and money can't fix, right? So when an issue arises that's big, that should require a constancy in prayer, what do we do? We pay to get it fixed, or we work harder. I'm not saying those things are necessarily bad in of themselves, but if they derail a committed prayer life, then you get what you get. If God seems, somehow seems small in your life, if he's not showing up and showing off in your life, and all you're doing is trying to fix everything in your own life, well, I'm going to tell you the problem isn't him, it's you. Why don't you try asking him and waiting? Why don't you try obeying the scriptures? Prayer. There's a struggle in our life because prayer, to be fair, seems a little weird, doesn't it? I'm talking, where is it going? I never hear anybody talking back, one-way conversation, how it feels, at least to me. I don't know what your prayer life's like. So we kind of grow weary of it. I think, uh, well, I'll confess it, I'm lazy. If I hit my knees to pray, pray, one minute later, I'm thinking about lunch. I don't know if anybody else is like that, but it's like, I have no ability to maintain long thoughts like that. I don't know a lot of prayers around me. I can't follow anybody's example. And I truly struggle with faith. That's why I doubt. I don't doubt God. Like I always say this, God's all powerful. He can do whatever he wants. He just won't do it for me. That's how it ends up. Like I just feel that way. It's wrong. I'm confessing it, okay? There's lots of reasons why we struggle with this kind of devoted prayer. But here you have a church. First description of it right out of the box, is devoted prayer. I can only imagine what they're going through, right? Confusion, fear, questions, doubt, strain, right? All those things, all the rejection possibly that they're anticipating. But their response was devoted prayer. I wonder, when I was writing this on Thursday, I said this, I wonder what the next generation or generations will say about us. Because this is like a historical thing. It's like Luke wrote down what they were about. What would they say about us? L- last Sunday, I found out I'm going to be a grandpa. That's good, right? Yeah. A little surprised, to be honest with you. Um, Jed and Whitney are going to have a baby. That's good. But I thought this when I wrote this. What would my grandchild say about me? He worked hard. He, he really did. He worked hard. But he... I don't remember him praying much. He was sort of self-sufficient. What would our grandkids write about us? They were devoted to what? Ourselves? Our lifestyles? Our opinions? What would they say? I'm convicted. When I write that, it's pointing at me, just so you know. I'm convicted by that. Listen, here's what I believe. We live in a world where we know more than we've ever known before. Information is multiplying as we speak. We have more than we've ever had before. We're richer than we've ever been before. We can do more than we've ever done before, and it's crippling us. Let me just remind you, I I don't have a ton of time, and I might fall short of finishing this task today, but let me remind you, Jesus' instructions on prayer, because there's a point to make here. And you know most of this. It says here um, in Luke 11. Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place when he had finished. One of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray. Now, we all know this passage. And he goes on to kind of give us the Lord's Prayer. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. So here's the reality. Great stuff on prayer. And there have been thousands and thousands and thousands of sermons about the details of what to include into your prayer. But what I want you to see is the emphasis of Jesus about prayer that he goes on to give us here. Verse 5, and he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me, the door is now shut and my children are, in me, are with me in bed. I cannot give, get up and give you anything. 
Jesus says, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he's his friend, yet because of his impudence, that, that is a like persistence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be open. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give him a serpent? Or if, his, if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Listen, the emphasis of Jesus, as much as there have been details written about the Lord's prayer, the emphasis is about the devoted prayer life, the consistent prayer life, the never quitting prayer life. I'll just prove it to you. When he says the persistence, yet because of his persistence, and when he says ask, seek, and knock, it's like ask and keep asking. Knock and keep knocking. Just keep seeking. And that last phrase, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? It's the word beg. Hopefully in your mind, what you're picturing as a kid going, dad, 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 right? That's what prayer is supposed to be. In Jesus' mind, persistence, because you're certain dad can do something about it. That's the devoted prayer life that this church, just right out of the box, starts to express in its life, all right? And the promise that we get from the Father is always good. Good gifts, good gifts to those who ask. Let me move on. Limited time. So we have a life change brought about by the resurrection that unites us and creates a, an empowered prayer life. But let the, here's a third thing. It makes us obedient to the word. Verses 16 through 20. Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke, spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who had become a guide to those who arrest Jesus. Now he goes on to talk about Judas' demise, how he died by hanging himself and his guts spilling open. That's another message. That'll be cool. Um, and then he refers to this. For it's written in the book of Psalms, may his camp be, become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. Um, I would imagine the defection of Judas confused the disciples at least a little bit. It would me. I mean, come on. Someone who Jesus picked someone who walked with us all these years, how could someone do like that? Was Judas a mistake? Was, was Jesus wrong? Um, why did God allow it? Those are, those are great questions, reasonable questions. But their answers are found, according to this text, in Peter's mind, in the word of God. He refers to Psalm 69 and 109 to answer the questions, why, Jesus did, why Judas did what he did and why um, the position had to be filled. Re remember, again, I tell you that 40 days Jesus spent teaching them about himself from the Old Testament scriptures. So as soon as Jesus leaves, they kept up the same pattern. What did the scriptures say about what's going on? What did the scriptures say about what we should do? And it makes sense, right? Peter's answer was the word. Verse 16, the scriptures had to be fulfilled. That's why Judas did what he did. Scripture said so. What do we do about it? Here's what it says, Psalm 20. It's been written in the book of Psalm concerning his replacement. Now, you might not be aware of this passage, but in Matthew 19, Jesus had already told the disciples that there would be 12 thrones and these disciples would sit on 12 thrones judging Israel. And so there's a missing man. We are gonna fulfill that missing man. The point that I want to make here is these men were no different than anyone else until Jesus, until the resurrection, until all of it became real in their minds. Suddenly they became a, an exceptional church, not, not because they're exceptional people, but because they believe in the word of an exceptional God. That's what changed things. In their minds, the answer is in his word, right? Jesus said of himself that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him, exclusively him. He is the truth. In fact, when he was tempted, he said, man won't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is the word of God that transforms us. And the exceptional church lives there. Let, let me do one more in six minutes. 
So, so far we've seen that this church is united to each other, devoted to prayer and obedient to God's word. Here's the last one. This resurrection empowers a trust in the sovereignty of God. This, path, this section is a little funky, but let me read it and we'll try to explain it. Verse 21. Um, so one of the men who have, who have accompanied us during all this time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism to John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become one of us as a witness to the resurrection. So here's what, here's what Peter's saying. We're gonna sort out what to do ab- about Judas and here's the qualifications. This man, whoever he is, has to have walked with us this whole time with Jesus and he has to be a witness to the resurrection. That's what he says here. And, and so they pick out two guys, Joseph and a guy named Matthias, verse 23. And this is what they did. They prayed. They prayed and said, you, Lord, you know the hearts of all. You show us which one of these two you've chosen. So far, we're cool with that, right, church? This is work in Gilbert. This next one's a little weird. Show us the guy. In verse 26, and they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered among the 11. Get out the dice. And we all kind of go, well, that's, that's weird. It's, it's strange, right? So arbitrary. L- let me explain here. Um, could you imagine if the way they selected Judas' replacement was by an election? We just went through one of those. How did that go? That popularity thing or this, this tension thing? I, I think more than likely, knowing these guys, there might have been a little bit of power struggle. But what these men did in their faith in the resurrected Lord was to trust in his sovereignty. They trusted him. They listed out the qualifications. He had to follow Jesus. He had to witness the resurrection. They prayed, and then they cast lots, little pieces of wood with names written on them, and they would shake them up like dice. The first one out of the bag, first name, the man. They believed that God controlled that order. That's what they did. Now, some have criticized the apostles for for casting lots, but you have to remember, casting lots was a time-honored way of determining God's will for Israel. In fact, the wisdom writer in Proverbs chapter 16 said this, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Their understanding was, we'll use this method, but we believe he controls the outcome. We trust in his sovereignty. He's in control, not us. He'll make the right decision, not us. And if Jesus picked the original 12, let Jesus pick the replacement. That's what they thought. That's the exceptional church, a people who are poor in spirit, who trust in a really, really big sovereign God. That's what this church is made of. So if I were personally to list the issues um, that reside in the human heart, it'd be a long list, but the first one on my list would be that natural man thinks that his life is up to him. Code, he thinks he's sovereign. He thinks the solutions to his problems are within his control. Natural man has a really twisted mind. He thinks it's small enough to fix on his own, and he's in charge. Here's what true freedom is. According to the gospel, the good news, true freedom is found in knowing that you're not sovereign and that he is sovereign. And his sovereignty is so big, here's how big it is, here's how you experience it. This sovereignty is so big that his salvation isn't just made possible for people. Like, it's up to you. Here's the options. Jesus has provided a way. Are you smart enough? Are you good enough to accept him? No, this sovereignty is so great. He makes your salvation certain for all who come to him. That's sovereignty. That's what we believe in. That's what the disciples believed in. That's a wonderful, loving God. And I am, I look at these 15 verses and I go, man, if they didn't write anything else about the church but this, we got a lot of work to do. We're 26 verses in and I'm underwater. Do you get this? Like they prayed and they were devoted. They didn't break the brokenness between each other. They believed in the sovereignty of God and they honored the word. That's a pretty big order, right? But let me just tease up next week because we're out of time, okay? Everything you heard, just to remind you about this exceptional church that we all have to ask questions about ourselves regarding, all of it, all of these behaviors happened before Pentecost, before the coming of the Holy Spirit in dwelling man. Why? What's going on? 
Like you and I don't have that experience. When we're converted, the Spirit indwells us. But they lived at least 10 days without the Holy Spirit, and they saw things that I would say, that's a great church. How was that possible? And why, then why the Pentecost? Why the coming of the Holy Spirit? Why the indwelling? Big deal, super convicting to me. Um, I'm ready to go already, so come back next week, and I'll tell you why, okay? I'll tell you why, and we'll leave. Hopefully, we'll leave really ready for something else, okay? All right, let's pray together. God, help us. Help us focus in on what it is to be poor in spirit, trusting in your provision. God, I pray that we would all echo the word, sinner saved by grace. That's what makes us exceptional, that we're loved by you, and that's it. God, I pray um, that you would make us one as Jesus prayed for us. God, that we'd restored, be restored to one another if there's brokenness. God, help us be a church devoted to prayer, trusting you, leaving room for you. I pray, God, you'd keep us in the word, trusting it in all that we do, knowing that you're sovereign over our life. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.